dialogue weekend. Policy speech interrupted. How will Carrie Lam get Hong Kong back on track? Young people speak out on climate change. This time, will the world listen? And Turkey and the U.S. reach an agreement on Syria, but will others go along with it? Now on Dialogue Weekend. Welcome to the first edition of Dialogue Weekend. I'm Xi Chindu. Here with me in the studio are Ms. Wu Changhua and Anna Tangen. Welcome to both of you. What's really baffling for this past week, you know, was is happening in Hong Kong. The uh, chief executive Carrie Lam was delivering her annual policy address. This is serious stuff. You know, she was trying to solve this crisis, but she was heckled repeatedly, and she had to give up and do it through the video, through the television. The second day, he was uh, trying to answer the questions from the legislature again, and she was uh, disrupted repeatedly. Forty of the opposition legislators uh, were taken away by the security guards. This is the paralysis, you know, this inability to solve this problem. Well, it's not, it's not a solved problem. This, this is a deliberate strategy on behalf of the, uh, of the protesters or the mob, as I would call them. What they, they don't want, a civilized discourse. What they're doing is they're just shouting. I mean, they're literally, they drowned her out the first day, and then the second day, each one would get up and turn to make sure that there were no actual questions. Now, one question get, did come through, and he started talking about what are the nuts and bolts of what you're going to do for Hong Kong. And this is not something that they want. So they immediately drowned her out, did not prevent her from doing it. She had to do it in a studio afterwards. Well, exactly. This is the problem. Like, there is a problem, and you are not trying to working together to work together to solve this problem instead it's uh, it's like a boycott you know, mm -hmm. like no whatever you say i don't work i don't listen to you mm -hmm. and i have five demands you have to meet the five demands you know lee xianlong of uh, singapore the prime minister uh, he said that uh, you know the five demands amounts to humiliation for the hong kong government mm -hmm. and uh, no government probably will say okay i will yeah, I would do it, <laughs> as you requested. I think that's where the challenge is today. That's why it's been lasting so long, right? And you just cannot find a common ground. So the, you know, all the parties coming together have a serious, a candid conversation in terms of what are the challenges, what their opinions are, my interests, whatever. Everyone puts things on the table, then you can have a discussion. But the worst scenario is happening now in Hong Kong. Basically, there is no, no such a situation or scenario that could be created, right? There are laws, regulations in place. There are policy targets that government wants to deliver, but somehow with this situation, the worst scenario ever, I call that, basically there's no way out at this yeah. moment. And, and, no, and no leadership, there's no one to talk to. What you do is just have shouting voices, people who are intent on making sure you don't mm -hmm. talk. The irony being that they're saying that they, they stand for the rule of law. I mean, this young man who went to get noodles, <laughs> no, this young man who went to get noodles across the street, he was uh, from an investment banking house, was beaten bloody on tape yeah. simply because he said, look, we're all Chinese. How is that threatening? How can you have a civilized society when you have thugs roaming in the middle of the day basically, beating people up? Basically, he tried mm -hmm. to be reasonable. Look, we are all Chinese. Let's talk to each other. Let's solve this problem. They were, they were heckling him because he spoke Mandarin when he ordered his noodles. Mm -hmm. And they followed him, a mob of them. He goes across the street. They're heckling him. He says, look, we're just all Chinese. For, for those yeah. who are not yes. familiar with the situation, because he speaks Mandarin, the standard Chinese here in China, and if you speak the language in Hong Kong, it's people Cantonese. see immediately you are yeah. from the mainland. So that's why people are saying that there's discrimination against the mainlanders in Hong Kong it's by the protesters. This isn't discrimination. This is just thuggery. This is terrorism. When you cannot walk across the street and get a bowl of noodles, mm -hmm. all right, because you will be beaten up by an angry mob, it, Look, civil society has ended. These people talk about civil society, mm -hmm. but they don't actually. This is really it. concerning because there's a, you know, uh, we know, you know, the cornerstone. One of the cornerstones of Hong Kong is really the rule of law. Absolutely. The spirit of the rule of law, and everybody respects the, the, the rules and the law, and then you have ordered the society. But now. And everything is broken at this moment, exactly. basically. So yeah. that, that's why actually the government somehow, the, 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 someone has to come up with a solution, right? And uh, you know, you can not only because of those few people, the mobs <laughs> actually, that's sort of all the people's life, everything actually is inter interrupted in Hong Kong. That's not fair, that's against the rule of law. It's but almost the, there's like only, daily violence. Over but there's there. only one real solution. And uh, these protesters are trying to push China into having an armed response, sending in the PLA mm -hmm. so that they can say, look, we're just freedom-loving people <laughs> and they're, they're crushing our hopes. There's one way out. 
and that is the Hong Kong people have to rise up. There has to be a referendum, and they have to say, we want order in our society. This is a society that used to criticize mainlanders because they didn't queue up yeah. <laughs> at the escalator. But and now they beat you bloody in the street because yeah. you had noodles. But my question on that is, why not yet, right? And uh, it's been carrying on for so long. How come Hong Kong people they, so far have they, not they been have able to reach they, a they point they where they're fed up? The, the thing is, like, you know, not only do the protesters, they are not alone in the problem in this sense. In the sense, they enjoy support from the UK, they enjoy support from the United States. For example, the bill of That's human outside. rights and democracy of Hong Kong. Can you imagine if, if China started passing laws saying that we, we really don't like what's happening in Puerto Rico? These are unrepresented people who've been left behind and ignored despite mm -hmm. massive tragedies. We're going to pass a bill that says we, won't, we will measure the U.S. response And they even got the gun trade. shooting, actually. <laughs> you know, if you look at the gun shooting, the violence, people, you know, many people died from the gun shooting. Mm -hmm. If Chinese government basically say, you know, we do not like that, we're going to pull whatever, the pass the bill. Pass or the law, yeah. right? It, it just shows ridiculous. how ridiculous is. You yeah. cannot have countries coming in and trying to this dictate how things are going in other countries, especially in something like this. They are in essence, and not only them, but the international press is now complicit you actually had a man from the FT, a reporter, who blocked the way from this guy getting away from the mob in order to get a picture. I don't think he was trying to do it. But, you know, the insensitivity. I mean, you're trying to deliver the truth to the world and what you want to see is bloody pictures so that you can sell more uh, print. That is irresponsible. The, the, the problem is that on the, on the first, uh, you know, uh, like a, a first level, the bill from the U.S. is the interference of the China's internal affairs. Hong Kong mm. is part of China. Yeah. Remember, there's a sovereignty issue, territorial integrity issue. And the second level is, if you look at the bill, if you check the content of the bill, basically they are trying to make Hong Kong just another Chinese city, not a special region anymore. Mm. And for example, if something happened, like what happened, like uh, Edward Snowden, now, if Edward Snowden was uh, hiding somewhere in Hong Kong, and you they are required, you are under right. obligation to transfer him back to Washington. Mm -hmm. Well, not, uh, yes, uh, not only transfer him back to Washington, but there is also this issue that they could end the special trade status that Hong Kong yeah. has. Now, this is up to the U.S. The U.S. gives this a special trade status. That's right. But this idea that they're using it to threaten Hong Kong, well, I thought they were supporting Hong Kong. Which is it? Do they <laughs> want to destroy it or they want to help it? And also remember, this is, the U.S. is doing this, of course, you know, they have their own benefits for the U.S. benefits. Also, always remember America first principle here. And also it's on the request of the, of the protesters, the leaders of the protesters, mm -hmm. including several of them, Joshua okay. Wong over jo there. Joshua Wong has uh, not graduated from college. I don't think that he is the main voice. He might be an emotional voice that is doing this. But quite frankly, there appears to be a lot of money and a lot of organization going into this, and that's not Joshua Wong. Well, let's uh, move on from this uh, crisis in Hong Kong to mm. a bigger crisis, uh, global issue, global climate change. Climate change. You know, yeah. this uh, what's outstanding is the youth activism. Mm -hmm. I know, Chang Hua, you have been following this for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, represented by, say, you know, uh, uh, Gregor... Greta uh, Thunberg. Yeah. 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 Uh, so last month, the situation is last month at the UN Climate Action Summit, and uh, the 16-year-old Swedish girl uh, named uh, uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, I think it literally made her emotional and amazing debut to the center of the world stage uh, by basically challenging global leaders, right, with how dare you, right? right That's repeated right. sort of how dare you. And uh, I think somehow it's overwhelmingly in a way that so the youth are coming on board, you know, pushing leaders, demanding leaders actually take actions because the crisis is literally, we live in it, everyone feels about it. The whole movement was started last October, last August actually, 2018. Mm -hmm. So far globally, there are more than 1.6 million students already joining the forces. Uh, in a lot of countries. All, all, all over the world actually. Mm -hmm. So it's not just one single person actually. So from per, 100 plus countries there. I think what the youths are demanding, one, is their voices need to be heard. Secondly, they demand for actions. It's not you can just talk about it. You have to really take actions at this moment. Interesting enough, in that context, actually, some grown-ups are starting to telling Greta and her peers to say, look, panic never leads to anything <laughs> good, right? Um, we, I'm parent, right? If you think of it, when your kids it feels like his or her future is in jeopardy, as a parent, you have the obligation. You don't want to feel your children's mm -hmm. future, right? And so I think that's where exactly the meaning, the significance of this youth-led climate change activism comes in. On this one, I'm with them, yeah, right? I, I, I appreciate their courage and I salute for their leadership. And very importantly, I think they give me hope.
I agree. I think yeah. uh, you know, she successfully drew the uh, global attention. I mean, uh, once more to she, climate change. Let's yeah, say. but once but once again, it's, it's an emotional appeal, and I, unfortunately, I, I do agree that this is a complex situation. You can't go into places like uh, India, uh, other countries which are still developing, and say, "Look, give it all up," because the political realities aren't there. And they don't have the fiscal realities. They don't have the money to do that. Now, you know, let's draw a parallel between two groups, between Hong Kong and this climate, both motivated by young people. The only difference is climate change is real. We're facing an extinction level event eventually, mm -hmm. all right? Whereas Hong Kong is a made up one. This is people's feelings about something that isn't actually happened. They've enjoyed the best of all worlds up to this point. They don't pay taxes to the mainland, things like that. But this event is very important. Mm -hmm. I think the wake-up call is to give that sense of urgency to the leaders and say, look, this is being supported. There is a political way in which you can support this using this kind of emotional. I action. understand that, you know, like uh, what you're talking about is really about in the developed countries, maybe say rich countries and developing countries, you have a different obligation and also about the ability. For example, for developing countries like, uh, like India, like China and other developing countries, they don't have the money. At the same time, the, their priority often is improving the living standard of the people. There are some challenges. At the same time, I think for, for individuals like us, other individuals in every country, you know, is there anything we can do to somehow change our lifestyle to reduce emission? Absolutely. I think that has been a very important element in the fact that say, how come, you know, we seem to be making efforts, taking actions, how come the efforts actually mm -hmm. just do not match up with what right, was needed right. there. I think fundamentally one issue is individual, right? Individuals like the youth are as a big thing changes today. It's us. We are the problem maker, right? And because we consume energy, we consume resources, we discharge waste, everything like that. So individuals have to change, right? In, now the, in China, in the government advocating sort of sorting your garbage, right? Recycling resources, everything like that. So there are many, many spots or steps like that happening now. But as I said, if you put everything, now scientists are, you know, you know do the calculations, adding, adding everything up together, they just do not match with, mm -hmm. you know, the challenge basically out there is way beyond what, what, what we're doing today. I think that's the space where the younger generation are coming up, basically saying, wait a second, now we know actually our future is in jeopardy. You know, where's my future? I don't want to lose my future. And the actions you're taking up now is not adequate. Very importantly, actually, if you look at the government making, decision making process, they do not have students sitting around the table. So that's another sense of urgency. Yeah, they right. want to but, be part uh, of but it. But, you know, it's fine to say that. But the fact is we are in the same position as we were in the 70s, 80s. Remember, th uh, think globally, act locally. locally. That was the slogan. <laughs> that students started being very activists. They appeared on these councils, and it fizzled out. There has to be some way of get, bringing this in. That's why I'm saying harness the political energy of these people, mm -hmm. but use it constructively, not this Bob thing. But I, I'm but tired I think of if we can protest signs. If we can pick up and also keep the momentum, for example, flight shame, and it's spreading to different parts of the world, to, to the business community, you know, we got to be careful about Yeah, the but then you have, you know, have Donald like Trump, who's, who, you know, <laughs> representing America, who is undoing the global <laughs> consensus, uh, the uh, Paris Climate Accord. In the most this, powerful country But you, in the world. Can't, you cannot have it. I, I really saw her anger is directed mm -hmm, directly mm -hmm, at people mm -hmm. like Donald Trump, who are climate change deniers, and who are actively undoing uh, ec you know, ecological But uh, don't, don't be that pessimistic. For example, there is a report in Britain that is like, uh, you know, what about uh, banning uh, mileage uh, in the practice of, you know, accumulating mileage mm. so you can get a free flight? Mm -hmm. uh, what about that? Uh, basically to prompt the people to fly less as necessary as possible. I think that's a very minor part of it. Yeah. I think it would be better to concentrate on things like, uh, you know, alternative energy, either hydrogen mm -hmm. or Technology. electric. They're doing a lot with electric short um, takeoff and, and things like this. Using yeah, to be fair, I think to be fair, you know, Greta is one person, but in this movement, it's just one single person. If you look at the youth, for instance, in Uganda, uh, youth yeah, students are actually paying more attention to the plastic issue, right? If you look at Mexico, the youth mm -hmm. students are focused on renewable energy there. In the U.S., of course, there are students basically you know, advocating climate strikes because of Trump's situation and doing everything. So around the world, I think, youths are taking, picking up issues. 
that are locally fit, they feel like a prioritize stuff like that. So I, again, to be fair uh, to the youth, I think it's one, it's urgently needed. We need, you know, decision makers need to yes. get that sense of urgency, which is a sort of a lacking in the UN system. Yeah. I don't think it's lacking. The question is political willpower. How do you do this? In the US right now, you have the youth saying we're concerned about this, but you have, you know, 40 year old factory workers who say, I don't care. Undo this. Give me that's coal a, back. A, let me, let me do this. The, the point is, like, you know, a lot of people, there's awareness. People know that. And yeah. most of the people, they know there's a crisis and we need to do something. Often the people, you know, ourselves, we are kind of lazy. Say, oh, yeah, something needs to be done. Uh, by Tonghua, probably. Somebody, oh, yeah. no, no, not by all, me. Yeah, exactly. Somebody so, should do something. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, just one point to add, I think. I think if you deep dive into this round of youth-led climate change activism, it, they have a very clearly defined strategy and logic there. One, I think they realize actually they need to get their voice heard, right? Only by their voices being awareness. heard, they will be able to leverage resources, support, to get the pressure mm -hmm. actually on, you know, their politicians. The government, yeah. the So society. there is a very wor well worked out logic or plan actually in that process. I'm, I'm just hoping they're going to be successful because youths are growing up quickly and they get part of the political landscape. They have to set up their efforts as well, right? This is about their future. I definitely applaud that sort of effort. Well, uh, hopefully, and uh, with awareness, we can transfer the awareness into action, mm -hmm. real action. Uh, but move on from this lot larger crisis to uh, another one, which is sort of being um, resolved, let's say, in Syria, northeastern part of the country, the border area, there's a pause or ceasefire, whatever you call it. Well, it's not really. I mean, Syria has broken into the headlines because of a, a, Trump, a call between Donald Trump and Erdogan, and which at some point Erdogan had believed that he had the green light. It was uh, further followed up when Trump withdrew American troops and therefore also the air support that was keeping uh, the Kurds who had been our ally. Now, remember, the Kurds were the ones who fought ISIS. They lost over 11,000 people in that fight. The U.S. lost five soldiers. I'm not minimizing loss. It's not about that. But the issue is that we promised we would never abandon them. At this point, the whole world is wondering what the word of America means. Meanwhile, it has been a huge victory for Russia, for uh, Syria, Turkey. But in one important thing, the Kurds were forced to do a deal with uh, the Syrian government. And at that point, this incursion became an invasion from Turkey into this area because they are not allowed to think. So I can't, you cannot have a country saying, I'm afraid of your country, so I'm going to invade it and establish a safety zone. But, but what's impressive is uh, President Trump's the unconventional approach using his own words. He said, like, uh, you know, you have to let them fight for a while and then you set them apart. It's like tough love parents to kids. In the kids are fighting each other, except parents fight to set them except, apart. Except in this case, and you have the largest million man army, well armed by NATO, who is going against uh, a group of people who have Kalashnikovs and, uh, you know, basically RPGs. Uh, so uh, uh, don't, don't tell me this is like setting two little boys to fight. No, One of them is going to die. Mm -hmm. and, and this is, I, it's incredible to me that he would minimize the deaths of a group of people who sacrifice themselves for our uh, goals. Yes, I think the other the consequences. I'm, I'm more like paying attention to the consequences there. Over the history, if you look at the wars or conflicts like that, at the end you have lots of refugees, yes, right? So, so the social order, the people dying, and the social order disrupted, and then people need to find a way where to live. And Europe, actually, EU is going to face another problem, another round of uh, refugees, a crisis, or whatever. So this is a very, very dis this is disrupting a, this sort is of policy from President Trump. Right. This is more than tough love. The thing is, like, what's also unconventional is his foreign policy. Uh, if you take a careful look you, at you that. You keep saying you unconventional. Know, he, he, what you should be saying is it's just completely nonsense. He's no strategy. The U.S. forces from, I say, the Middle East, from Afghanistan. His focus is on the, the building of the nation uh, domestically, and also. But he he's has a now point. putting him to Saudi Arabia, so point. they're not leaving. Well, he has a point. <laughs> That's the border between Syria and Turkey. That's not the border between Turkey and the United States. That's true. It's yes. so far away from the U.S. And then why are we there? 
Why did we go into uh, Iraq? All right. But, Why did we go into Afghanistan but, oh, but if it's not on our border? And I, it does not stand up to any kind of logical things. If we don't care about it, we don't care about it. But if we do, you can't say we do now and we don't. And obviously, he he's then, adopting we a different know. policy yeah, from previous case, presidents. In this case, there is a special reason why this 1,000 special forces are from the U.S. Sort of are have been there basically in the Kurdish mm -hmm. because the Kurdish have been fighting ISIS for the terrorists in 911, right? And uh, so there's but they a were very kept there after ISIS to guarantee the Kurds' safety. That yeah. was our deal with them. Yeah. Please, we will help you. These are our enemies too. And they but do not desert us. Actually do not desert us. Do not do true. what has been happening also, for the last six years. Also, interestingly, if you take a look at the tweet of a from President Trump and also President Erdogan from Turkey. Basically, they are talking about, yes, defeat terrorism, defeat terrorists, but they are talking about different kinds of terrorists. Yeah. For, for Turkey, uh, the, the, the Kurdish fighters and the PKK, they are related. They say they are the mm -hmm. terrorists we need to defeat. For the U.S., oh, they, were, you know, they are our friends. And also, the, the terrorists for the U.S. is really ISIS fighters, or the you know, uh, sleep cells over there somewhere in the region. Yeah. Well, uh, look, you know, if one nation's freedom fighters are another one's terrorists. Mm -hmm. You have to judge this by actions, all right? We dealt with the Kurds, and we asked and enlisted their help. We armed them. We made promises to them. If they are terrorists, why were we dealing with them? All right? You That's cannot say question. now now they're terrorists. Back then they were our friends. It's either they are, they are not going into and doing incursions into Turkey right now. This is all about fear. But, but mean, also, in a, okay, I'm, 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 I'm like trying to defend the President Trump. Anyway, uh, here, here's the point. I mean, the, the, the Republican Party can't defend them anymore. How can you? No, the U.S. is not being paid, say to guard the border between Turkey and Syria. It's not being paid, say, to fight in Afghanistan, right? We made a deal. If you read The Economist today, they said, who can ever trust the United States again? Mm -hmm. That's a good and point. This is I understand that. Throughout NATO, everywhere else, everyone is right now doing the calculations. That's what if something happens? Will yeah. Donald Trump throw us under the bus? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's also, very possible. That's yeah. also why people are uh, basically saying that, oh, probably we are having too many allies. When there's a problem between our ally, you know, the, the Kurdish fighters and the Turkish uh, fighters, then we have a problem. And also when our allies, you know, Japan and the South Korea, when they are fighting, we also have a problem here. Yeah. You know, we have hundreds of thousands of men stationed on bases around the world. One thousand men who are just in that, or yeah. I shouldn't say men, personnel yeah, who personnel. are in there, yeah. who are guarding what we thought was a very valuable ally who helped us achieve an objective we could not do ourselves, we needed boots on the ground, who made enormous sacrifices, all right, to pull them out, all right, means that they were going to die. Mm -hmm. And they were forced to uh, go to their only option, which was to make a deal. I think another issue is in that particular region, you started to, to see the geopolitical forces sort of shifting now, right? Mm -hmm. And now, of course, the Americans are concerned about the role of Russia, Iran, actually, in the region. Yeah. That's another sort of interesting angle to see how the dynamics will shape, you know, at the very end, who will have more influence in that region and what does that mean, actually, to the global community? Well, no, there's but no that's question. That's Russia has emerged as a clear winner. They're, mm -hmm. they're both friendly with Turkey, you know, the, the S-400 yes. system. Yeah. They're also uh, the main supporters of, Syri of the Syrian government. Um, they're in a position where these guys are kind of going in. But they will be the power that comes we, in. We are and they have been reliable. Yeah, no that's matter what true. you say, I don't agree with uh, what yeah. they're doing, but yeah. they have been reliable. The world looks. Yeah. Even for the U.S., whether the sort of ISIS, the terrorists, would become a, the, you know, another round of major threat to the U.S. You know, security or yeah. national security right. and safety at this moment, I think that's another question. 70,000, including families and fighters. That, those are the groups that are now going to be unleashed. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they're going to go back home and mm -hmm. decide that they're going to be peaceful. Yeah. And also, of course, you know, the, the immediate worry is like where they will go and where they will launch another potential attack, either in the region or in the European countries or even in the United States or some other countries. And the second worry is really about the radicalization, the ideology is kept alive. And the ideology will spread, young people somehow will be affected in well, some part of the world. Let's look at this. You know, young people who are looking at this and say they're dissatisfied with life, they see this group, okay, was defeated. But through the um, ineptness of the powers that be, they were free. So they're going to be seeing this mm -hmm. as a victory for uh, groups like ISIS. They can, they can succeed even after defeat. 
This is the wrong message. Okay, let's uh, leave it for now and take a look at this week's newsmaker. About the man, you know, I know previously people have all kinds of doubts about him. He's seen as oh, the Trump of the United Kingdom. He's not reliable. He's not going to solve a problem. He's creating more problem, problem. But now he's presenting the deal to the EU. The EU says, well, that's fun, and we'll talk about it. Probably we'll agree upon, uh, we'll agree with you on that deal. So there's some progress here. No, and when we start talking about the man, as I think, he, he, he's a bit of a mess. I mean, you know, this, this thing with this American businesswoman who was brought along and refuses to answer questions about yeah. their intimate relations, the, the fact that they are, he's on tape having some sort of hmm. uh, violent brawl with his current uh, girlfriend, girlfriend, who has yeah. now girlfriend, moved yeah. into 10 Downing. Mm -hmm. um, and his, you know, his, his past has been checkered. I mean, he was fired a number of times for basically making things up. Uh, there's still questions and an and a, uh, investigation of his claim during Brexit when he was pushing it about the $350 million a week that was going to be saved, all of this kind of things. There's real questions about him and his reliability. This is where yeah. he and Trump are very much similar. Yeah. No one can rely on them. No one believes them. Somehow, I think, you know, some people would say, maybe, wait. He's serious, and he's a shoot politician. He's even How is he, he, But he hasn't and traded. He, he hasn't he done anything changed, yet. You know, the deal that failed to pass the parliament by mm -hmm. Theresa May now is being changed by uh, Boris Johnson, and he presented again to the EU. Of course, okay. he solved the problem. Remember, no, he hard hasn't border, solved no hard no, border. No, no. No, yes, <laughs> yeah. but it, no one agrees to it. It wasn't the hard border that was the issue. And it's the getting the part. It's the parliamentary votes. All right. So yeah, don't talk about specific issues. It's the package. Yeah. And he has not delivered the package. Many people are saying that the deal he's offering is worse than Theresa May's. Uh, from the reading I've done, actually, oh. just look at the analysis. Uh, you know, compared to Theresa May's experience, he seems to have a much bigger chance. Partly also because of the thing he has, probably Theresa May didn't have enough back then, is the tiredness of the constituency. People are really, really tired of this, you know, drag so long, the uncertainty, the Im people feel it actually, the impacts, you know, on the business, everything like that. So I think this is a sort of little bit different scenario compared to what Theresa May had. Remember <laughs> with the uh, Theresa May deal, there's a problem with the backstop. Uh, that is the problem. Northern Ireland is that is over there. And there's there. a problem with hills on all sorts of levels. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean I'm this this <laughs> this soft border thing and and the way that they've set up the the union and things like that. It's not a problem. You're already having Scotland saying we're gonna we'll vote this way or that way as long as we get to have an independence yes. vote. Yes, yeah. that that's, that that's tells the, you that Great Britain will soon be Britain. If there's a, a real Brexit and the Scotland say next year we are going to have another independence vote, so there's a likelihood. There's a real likelihood Scotland will be independent uh, of Britain. Uh, oh, and that, that, will be and that will be very interesting because now if Scotland goes to the EU, now you have a situation yeah, where you have Ireland northern Ireland in between these different pieces. <laughs> and I guarantee you, if Scotland, Scotland goes, you're going to start hearing from the Welsh because the, Wel the Welsh have felt undervalued for years, uh, you know, overlooked, ignored. I and they could quite yeah. possibly say, look, we want no part of this organized confusion, this let's jump off the cliff because we've been standing here forever and then just see what happens. I s for, you know, from where I stand, I, I see definitely see the likelihood. There's no doubt about it. But at the end of the day, if you look at the why the UK, British people want to get out of EU, they have very good reasons, right? And, they, and laws, regulation, they feel like I need to control, you know, stuff like that. They rather had than the best rights. deal in the EU. They kept their own well, currency. I, think it they had so I, know, I know we will talk yeah. a lot about that. Yeah. Maybe next, uh, next uh, editions. With that, we are coming to the end of today's show. You can watch us on the CJTN app or on YouTube. I'm Xu Qianduo. You can follow me on Twitter, Xu Qianduo. Thank you for watching. See you next week.